Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night teaching. Let me make sure I got everything set right. Uh, tonight what we wanted to do is talk a little bit about the Dead Sea Scroll discovery that was last week and uh, kind of go on a little bit further from it, study a few things that uh, most people are not looking at. And basically, um, when these things come out, everybody's excited on what they have and how old it is and other things connected with it. Uh, and basically, they don't kind of pull everything together. And that's what we need to do. Uh, for instance, I have friends that um, study a lot of the Egyptian artifacts, the Egyptian history, to try to prove there really was an exodus. You know, and that's fantastic. Some of us need to do that. Uh, for the rest of us, I think if you're like me, I would like to find any kind of evidence for that. But then, more importantly, if there's extra information in documents about that kind of thing, uh, just going forward like that. So that's why we're trying to find more Dead Sea Scrolls, um, things like that. So let's recap real quick. Basically, last Tuesday... I think it was Tuesday. Uh, yeah, it was actually the Tukufa Eve, or the, actually the Tukufa. Um, so day before New Year's on God's calendar. So pretty interesting. They found, and they, they'd found this before, and it was just made public that day. But in one of the caves, there was a, well, back in the 1950s, it was originally discovered, and they had discovered uh, 13 skeletons, I believe. So it was named the Cave of Horrors. And the concept was, and what they had found out was they were uh, people from the um, Bar Kokhba Rebellion. So this would date this around 135 uh, AD, uh, give or take some stuff. So that was removed. It looked like everything was, nothing else was left. But in an effort to go back and double check things, they went back, found a new section of the cave. And in that cave, they found um, a very ancient basket. They found another uh, skeleton. And then they also found some coins dating from the Barcopa era. So that's good. That helps date some of those things. And then they found two uh, partial manuscripts. And our, all these are is basically uh, the last half of one verse beginning half of the other verse to let you know it's a couple of verses of a particular um, document. And so in our case, they had two pieces. One was um, Jeremiah, excuse me, not Jeremiah, Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. And that had, it was almost identical. Matter of fact, let's look at that. We'll just go through this a piece at a time. And then we're going to look at Nahum, which is our main focus tonight. But in Zechariah chapter 8, and I'm just using our eSword program, verses 16 and 17. So this is what they found here. Again, the last half of this and the first half of this. <clears throat> but it's interesting. Uh, it says, these are the things that ye shall do. So this is God talking to the people of that time. And if it's morality or anything to do with godliness, it would be the same as our time also. So the things that you should do, speak every man truth to his neighbor, execute judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And what was interesting is the word for uh, gates in the Dead Sea Scroll version was streets. And you'll see that kind of thing going through the Dead Sea Scrolls. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference, although I would think gates would be more correct because the concept is someone who sits in the gate of a city is a judge of that city. So there's Noahide judges and courts and Jewish judges and Jewish courts and maybe Roman courts if you're being occupied or whatever. But sitting in that, so peace in your gates means everything is fair, uh, judgment is fair, righteousness and justice is going forth. Uh, but it says, in your streets, but that basically be the same thing. Let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. 
and love no false oath. These are the things that I hate, says the Lord. And so what's interesting about this, none of us should try to cheat our neighbors or anything like that. We should try to help our neighbors achieve uh, the best that they can do. We should be happy for them if they get the promotions that we don't, etc. And the false oath, um, I think a lot of us <clears throat> absolutely detest a false oath because almost always you're going to get caught and there's going to be a really bad thing to pay for it. A lot of times you think, well, this is some lie that it won't make any difference. And we don't realize that everywhere you go, no matter who you lie to, it makes a difference and usually comes back on you. If you end up lying to somebody, even if it's not to your boss and you get a reputation of stretching the truth, you're not going to be thought of as a righteous person. You're not going to be given the promotion. You may get fired, etc. So you, you never want to do false oaths. You never want to lie about anything or curse or try to hurt anything. So every man speak truth to your neighbor, execute judgment, don't make evil plans, and don't swear a false oath or lie. Those are the things that the Lord hates. So if they would have done that back in the day, it really would have been better for them. So thinking about our calendar with this, uh, Zechariah is talking about the things that are what are happening right after they come back. So um, from the, the last, or the eighth una actually, which is what they're going to be focusing on, the Dead Sea Scrolls, is between 425 B.C., and 75 AD, that 500 year period. So Zechariah is before this time, but he's talking about right now in his time and going forward. So what's interesting is, um, we'll look at this and the Dead Sea Scrolls will take all these things. And even though he's talking directly to the people of his time, the points are the same. So none of us should speak uh, lies, swear falsely, do evil to get our own way, uh, but do justice and peace and truth. And this is what's happening because shortly thereafter, a movement develops in Israel, and it becomes known to us as the Sadducees. Uh, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls actually gives us an approximate date of when the movement itself started. There's always weirdos, and there's always people in government uh, that are good and some that are bad and some that try to cheat you and kill you and overtax you and all this stuff. So th th those come and go all the time. But this particular movement became known as Sadducees, and we've studied that for quite a while. But in the old text, I found this a few weeks ago, uh, talks about they actually started in the time of Demetrius of Greece. And that puts us two kings down from Cyrus. So in the five... Actually, in his time, would have been 280s, 290s, something like that. Uh, so really interesting to think of Sadducees or the movement that would become Sadducees back that far. Um, but as you can see, if the Sadducees weren't righteous, which we know they're not, even if you just look at the Bible, the Bible tells us that the Sadducees didn't believe in ever, the um, everlasting life. They didn't believe in angels or demons or anything like that. They believe that once you're dead, you're dead. Now, with that in mind, we know they're not believers. They're not even her heretics by definition. They're just flat non-believers. And so these are people that would do anything to get what they want. They get into a position of power and remain there. So this is what we're talking about here. So at this point, let's move over to uh, let me go back here to Nahum, which is what we want to really talk about tonight. And we'll look at this. And I'm sure you've read Nahum many times, or a few times anyway. Um, and Nahum, this is basically the prophecy of the Babylonians coming in and destroying Nineveh. Uh, and so they, they, they rise up. The Ninevites, the Assyrians were very, very ruthless. And you have all of this stuff going on. Now, God's wrath is poured out upon them. But if you stop and think about it, anybody who is a, in a governmental structure 
whether they're elected or they've taken over in in this case these guys are ruling or or have taken over uh the 10 tribes anyway and have done whatever they've wanted to with it so there's probably heavy taxes there's a lot of uh, uh murder uh, a lot of enslavement a lot of things like that going on and so those kind of things are what we look at a lot of times for uh, what God is moving against. But what the Dead Sea Scrolls are going to show us is that, number one, you don't have a movement of people that want to attack and kill you uh, just to get money, when you could get money another way, that kind of thing. Um, so that comes from a weird form of government. And so the weird form of government is those that do certain things. And they're going to be described in chapter 1. And what the Essenes are going to do is say, whether or not you believe this is a double fulfillment prophecy of that time period and ours, either way, the concepts are the same. If, uh, Like, for instance, if we had an apostasy in that time period, no matter how you do it, in, in its very simplified form, they rejected the Messiah. So if our Christian denomination now apostatizes, or there are pockets of our different Protestant groups or whatever that are apostatizing, when they do that, they will reject Messiah. Well, how do you go from believing Messiah to being a rejecter of Messiah? There's got to be certain steps. And in other words, they've got to be convinced that way from something that looks good. As it says in the book of Gad, it talks about how in the beginning, this is right and that's wrong. And then the next stage is like, well, they're both kind of right, but this, this is what we should be doing. But that's not really that big of a deal. Then the next stage is, well, this is really right. These guys were wrong. They were uh, old-fashioned, they were uh, narrow-minded, they were excited. It's okay, too, but they were just weird. We know better now. And so what's used to be called sin is now the proper way that these poor guys don't understand. And then in the fourth level, the last level, according to Gad, they call evil good and good evil and actually persecute those people who do good. So it's a four-stage process, according to that prophet. And it's kind of the same thing. They start out saying, we worship God, we worship Jehovah, uh, we understand the prophecies. One by one, they change the prophecies. They change what they mean or their interpretations. And you have people that say, I disagree with you. I think the prophecies mean something else. And so they have to somehow shut the other guys up. Um, because, for instance, if... Um, if I said that um, you're only saved if you wear a white hat or a black hat or something like something stupid like that, nobody's going to buy that. Well, when the other guy comes up and says I'm stupid and presents pretty good evidence as why I'm wrong, nobody's going to listen to me. So I've got to somehow silence him or change the story somehow and make it so convincible that things flip around. And if you think about this, the Antichrist is going to be so clever that it says in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians, if it were possible, he would deceive even the very elect. Think about this. When Satan fell from heaven, obviously he's wrong and God's right. But how did he convince one-third of the angels to follow him? That is a pretty good con job if you think about it. I mean, I don't know what story he came up with, but it must have been a doozy if you think about that. So there are ways that make something so ridiculous sound logical, and that's what we have to watch out for. They had to watch out for it in Nahum's day, in the first century, and Paul says we're going to have the same kind of things here. Maybe a totally different subject, but the concepts are the same. The way it happens is the same. So let's look at this. Let's look at Nahum chapter 1. We'll just read through it. <clears throat> and then we'll look at the Dead Sea Scroll commentary on it and focus in on that and think about some of its what, what it's talking about. Um, so anyway, uh, 
before we get started, I guess I'll look at this. This is uh, verses 5 and 6. So that Dead Sea Scroll fragment that was released <clears throat> last week, which Zechariah 8, 16 and 17, and then Nahum uh, 1, 5 and 6. So this part here that's highlighted. So let me just read the whole thing to you, and when we get to that part, we'll, we'll see what it says. Uh, this is the burden of Nahum, the book of the vision of Nahum the Eshkelite. God is jealous, and the Lord revenges. The Lord revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not acquit the wicked. For the Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and in the clouds that are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up the rivers. Bashan languishes. Now, Bashan is the old word for the Golan Heights. And Carmel, that would be uh, in Israel, I believe, but close to the Palestinian area. The flower of Lebanon languishes. Now, of course, Lebanon is Lebanon today. Hezbollah territory. The mountains quake at him, the hills melt, and the earth burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Now this, he could be talking about the world as they know it, their government, their stuff. But again, it's interesting that this could extrapolate further. And he's saying the world, Eretz, which might be land, but everyone that dwells in the land or everyone that dwells in the world. We're going to have the same kind of thing when the Antichrist comes. Um, so, who can stand before his indignation? Who is able to abide the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. So this is pretty neat, because verses 5 and 6 are what they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So again, speak uh, truth to your neighbor, don't lie, don't cause problems, and then they do it anyway, and eventually God rises and causes judgment. Now again, they were probably killing people and doing everything else, but it comes from lying, not speaking ill of your neighbor, plotting something, um, those kind of things. Whether the neighbors just take it or they rise up and attack you or whatever, this causes the problem. So if we go on, it says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. Now we have troubles, but we do need to focus on the Lord. And he knows them that trust in him. Isn't that a comfort? But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. Now, this could be saying a lot of things. If you'll notice, a lot of times in the Old Testament, the Lord sends confusion on the enemies, and the enemies usually destroy each other when God moves. Could be talking about that. But in this over, overrunning flood, um, this concept is mentioned in several places, uh, like an overwhelming or overrunning scourge. So it's some sort of a judgment that happens quite often. And uh, there's another place in Isaiah that says almost the same thing, talking about a, 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 um, a coming scourge that happens to them at that time period, and probably is very similar again to us in, in our future, the Antichrist time period. What do you imagine against the Lord? Well, he will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. So when the Lord moves, it's permanent. Nothing kind of comes back again. While they are be folded together as thorns, while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. 
So these people are in a position of power. They're over the Israelites. They're enslaving them. They're killing them. They're doing whatever they want to with them. They're drunk. Uh, most likely that's literal as far as the Ninevites go. Uh, but when the destruction comes, they'll be overtaken like a flood, like a scourge instantly, and they'll be destroyed. Just like extremely dry things when you light a match to it. Poof. Um, let's see here. Going on down here. There we go. Uh, there is one come out of three that imagines evil. Uh, one comes out of the rather that imagines evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Now think about this. Um, uh, we were talking about the Ninevites ruling over Israel and being wicked. Now we're talking about someone who is a counselor for the Lord, like a Pharisee, a Sadducee, or somebody, um, doing evil, apparently like that in some way, a wicked counselor. So thus says the Lord, though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet they shall be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. For now I will break his yoke from off of thee, and I will burst thy bonds asunder. The Lord has given a commandment concerning thee, that no more of thy name shall be sown. Out of the house of thy gods I will cut off the graven image and the molten image, and I will make thy grave, for thou art vile." Now, when I used to read these things, I would be looking for prophecy in them, and I would get to places like this when it talks about a graven image or a molten image. That's an actual idol, like a little little idol that somebody would be, or maybe a big one, but somebody would be worshiping or bowing down to. And so I would look at this and say, well, this is obviously that time, because they didn't have idolatry when they came back from uh, Babylon. An actual, actual real idolatry stopped. But what the Dead Sea Scrolls talk about is that idolatry comes from ignorance. A normal, rational person does not bow down to a stone and ask it to do something for you. So they have to be taught or warped in such a way as to believe this. Well, the only way you can warp it is by bad doctrine. So what the Dead Sea Scrolls will be saying is that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, even though neither one of them would have an actual statue, that would just be totally out of the question. No kind of idolatry at all. The Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essenes, none of them would have idols. But the Essenes talked about bad doctrine as being idolatry. It's that concept that you've been taught very clearly in the scriptures that the Messiah will come and die for your sins. He will reconcile you to God. He's God incarnate. He comes at a certain date, and this event happens. Right afterwards, there's the age of grace that starts. If you're humble, you can enter the covenant and be a child of God. All these things are taught very clearly. And they have said, no, that's not right. That's something else. We're going to teach something different. Well, that, that makes you an idolater. So in other words, if I started my own cult today, I claim to be Christian and worship Christ, but it's a different way. You know, we may not actually have idols, but it's a really weird, twisted, demonic type church. And so you'd call me a cult. Well, in that sense, that's what they would be saying. Idolatry is a cult. And so, even though we're talking about a graven image and a molten image, this could apply to Pharisees and Sadducees from the Essene point of view, depending on what they taught, if it's the same kind of thing. So, if the Essene or Sadducee or Pharisee, anybody in your pastor, says, I don't care what the Scripture says, you do what I tell you, that's a very dangerous position to be in. You know, the pastor should say, I think I know the scriptures much better than you do, but why do you think I'm wrong? You show me. And then if you show a verse that actually says that, he ought to rethink, if he's a Christian and loves the Lord, 
because his relationship with the Lord is more important than his relationship with you. So he should get right with the Lord. Uh, likewise, if he shows you that you're wrong, you're interpreting it wrong, then you need to repent. And that's cool. We all have different ideas and we get together and try to learn. But when he says, I don't care what the scripture says, it's going to be done my way. That's when you depart from that and you're making yourself into an idol or you're making yourself or your own um, theology a god. Okay. Which is the reason why the hatred comes. See, I'm a pre-tribber, for instance. And if you guys said, well, say like your post, uh, and you come to me and say, this is why, and I think you're weird. My answer would be, okay, if you want to know why I'm a pre-tribber, we can sit down, I can explain it to you, but you probably don't want to know. You probably think you already know all that. And that's fine. I mean, there's a possibility I could be wrong. I doubt it. But... It, that's the point. My attitude would be, okay, fine. You're still a brother in Christ if you're a believer. The pre, mid, or post-trib thing is not a salvation issue, so I'm not going to argue about it. On the other hand, if I was making my doctrine into a god or being idolatrous in it, I would be ready to fight you. I would have to convert you. I mean, you, you, you have got to know you're wrong, and I will make sure of it. That would be that kind of concept. And as we see, that's what we had with the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Essenes. The Sadducees took over the government, and if you didn't do what they said, they would execute you. The Pharisees would excommunicate you, would, would put you in prison, whatever. The Essenes would simply go away, you know, to themselves. Don't follow us out here. Now, if you attacked them, they would defend themselves, but that's different. So the whole concept is, is different. It's, it's the excommunication concept, if you come to my church and teach something weird, we ask you to leave. If you refuse, we will make you leave. We're not going to incarcerate you and put you in a cell under the church. If something like that, you're going to be forced out. So there's a difference between an attack and trying to be separate. So this is interesting. These guys were idolaters properly. And in the first century, they won't have actual idols, but they're doctrines make them idolaters last verse here says behold upon the mountains of the feet of them that brings good tidings that publishes peace O judah keep this thy solemn feasts perform thy vows for the wicked shall no more pass through they through thee he is utterly cut off so jesus kind of mentioned the same thing if they would have known the time of their visitation they wouldn't have had to have been destroyed. But the wicked were in control. The people allowed the wicked to stay in control, so the nation was destroyed. If the people would have rose up and done something, it might have been different. But then again, the prophecies were specific, so maybe they couldn't have done anything. But notice this. Behold, on the mountains are the feet of him that brings the good tidings, or the good news. Uh, this is the word basar in Hebrew, which good news, it's how we translate it in Greek as gospel. So this is actually what this says. Behold on the mountains of the feet are him that bring the gospel, that publishes peace. Now this is in other places too, but the Dead Sea Scrolls talk about this verse um, in other places and say that the people that bring the good news are the direct ambassadors of the Messiah when he comes. And the good news is going to be about the Messiah and the offer that he gives. And it's really interesting to see. So they should have kept this, but they didn't. So this is um, an oracle against Nineveh, but you can already see that there are pieces of these things like this one about the coming of Messiah um, this one that seems to be idolatry, which makes you think that's got nothing to do with us, but understanding it the Essene way, it might. And then coming back to these other things, we can actually begin to see how they would get something. So let's now turn to our commentary. And this is... I could find it here. There we go. Still working on this. This is the prophetic pieces from some of the scrolls, and it's going to still take me a while, but here, here's the, some of the commentaries. We're still putting them together because 
Uh, you might have, like, for instance, the MICA commentary. It's 1Q14, 4Q168. There may be other fragments. Um, so we want to look at the Nahum commentary because that's the piece that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls last week. So let's go ahead and look at this. So this is the Nahum commentary from 4Q169. It starts at verse 3. So um, let's just look at this again. So you can't withstand God or Jehovah because he's in the whirlwinds. He, when he gets ready to move, when he's had enough, he destroys and nobody can withstand him. You don't hide in the mountains and then wait till it's all over and pacify him somehow and then go back to doing the same stuff that you did. When he's angry enough to destroy, you will be destroyed. You have to repent beforehand. You know, so this kind of a thing. So this is the verse three says, Jehovah has his way in the tempest and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. We read that. So here's what it says as far as the commentary. The interpretation is the tempest and the storm are from the firmaments of his heaven and of his earth, which he created. So they're talking about an actual storm or tempest. Now, what's interesting to me about it, they have, and you guys probably ought to go back and look at this, and many of you probably know, but there have been books written about how when we as a nation, the United States I'm talking about now, uh, betray Israel, trying to do like a um, two-state solution, Israel gives up land for peace, not understanding that the prophecies like in Joel specifically said that God hates those who divide his land. Israel doesn't own Israel. The nation or the land there belongs to God, and God chooses to give it to Israel. Israel messed up big time. God kicked him out of the land, and it was barren for the longest time. So a usurper comes and lives there, but has no right to do so. But now God has pulled his people back and put them, his people in his land, not his people in their land. So it's, it's that land. So when someone, even they, decide we'll divvy up this and give this part of it away you don't have the authority to do that and god gets angry when you start doing things like that uh so a lot of times throughout the uh, oh 20 or 30 years um uh, there's this really good book called eye of the storm and it goes through and mentions um uh, how we uh decided to side with palestinians or divide land for peace or do this to israel or maybe we did the opposite that administration did the opposite and it choreographs the earthquakes and the heat and the ice storms and the tempests the, the hurricanes some seasons hurricanes don't hit and they ought to be random but when you start looking at these things and seeing how they're not exactly random you begin to see a pattern and this is where you get like the weirdos on the internet that, that say that, you know, Russia owns a, um, Russia or China, somebody has a weather manipulation machine, you know, that can cause the weather to attack, you know. And a lot of us look at that and think, where in the world are they getting this weird stuff? Well, number one, they're recognizing a pattern, but it's not people that have a weather manipulation machine. God is in the whirlwinds. And God can cause things to move a certain way. And so you have to go back and look, you know, if there's an actual pattern to something like that. So that's really interesting. So in this, ta in this case, they're, they're saying the interpretation is literal. God is literally in the storms and the firmaments and may destroy that way. So you got to be careful. And then in uh, 1.4, it says that he rebukes the sea and dries it up. That interpretation is the sea is all of the Romans. Now, let's stop there for a minute. In the Nahum commentary proper, we're talking about the Babylonians attacking the Assyrians. And in the first century, the main problem is the Sadducees. But they're interpreting this, and they're, with their theology, they're saying this is a multiple fulfillment prophecy. It refers to the Assyrians and the Babylonians and Nahum and the Ten Tribes, the same things happen to us. There's, 
it's not so much that it's Romans, but it's an outside force like the Babylonians or the Ninevites that were allowed to come in by a corrupt government somehow. And the corrupt government has this kind of weird doctrine. And it was the same then as it is now and will be in the next age. So in our case, if this has something to do with our end time prophecy, it may not be the Romans at all, but somebody, you know, and we're talking about in the, in where Israel's at. So it may not be Greece this time. It may not be Rome. It may not be the Seleucid Empire from Syria, although it, you know, it's something. But some foreign power will come in. And of course, the Antichrist is the king of a nation north of Israel. So that's a foreign power when he comes. So he will be allowed to come in through peace, Daniel says. So let's go on. The interpretation is that the sea talked about here. He dries, the, rebukes the sea and it dries up. The sea is all the Romans who came in to do something. To execute judgment against them and destroy them from the face of the earth, together with all the rulers whose dominion shall be ended. Now, this is interesting here because this is how a lot of people will say something like, see, this was the prophecy, and the Romans didn't get destroyed by the Maccabees or anything. The Romans were there. As a matter of fact, Israel stopped being a nation. So Rome destroyed Israel, and then Rome continued to exist. So the prophecy's fake. It never happened. And people will think about it like that and think, well, yeah, it seems to be that way. But the other prophecies are specific. Rome breaks up. The prophecies is that Israel is dispersed. Even Numbers 24, Balaam's prophecy, which is like uh, about a thousand years earlier than this, says that the ships of Kittim, Rome, will come in and actually destroy Eber and Assyria and in one, one at a time. But they'll both be destroyed. And then they come back because there's the second return. And this is all in Isaiah and other places. So that being the case, if this is mainly correct, but this part seems to be out of place, maybe it has something to do with not Zechariah's time, not their time, but our time. It's something to look at. So as Christians, we know there's not errors. So if you want to try to argue that there is or is not errors, that's a good thing to do for a witnessing standpoint. But to understand end-time prophecy, we need to not get distracted with that, so to speak, but look and see what's going on. So there are these invading people. At that time, it was Romans. The other time, it was Babylonians. Next time, it'll be the Antichrist from somewhere. But God destroys them, even though they seem to be totally uh, overwhelming. Uh, together with their rulers, and I don't know if their rulers are the rulers, the Roman rulers, excuse me, uh, or the rulers of Israel, because of what it says in a minute. So this is what it says, Bashan and Carmel withers, and the sprout of Lebanon withers. So again, Lebanon is Lebanon. Carmel is Mount Carmel, or that area. Uh, today would be close to Palestinian territory. And Bashan is the Golan Heights, which is between Israel and Syria. And there are a number of prophecies about Bashan in the end, our end times, half of which have been fulfilled. So that's what it says here. Bashan, Carmel, and Lebanon wither. The interpretation is many will perish by it during the height of wickedness. Uh, Carmel, something happens, and then Carmel to his rulers. Lebanon... And the sprout of Lebanon are the priests, the sons of Zadok, and the men of their council, and they will perish from before something. And then it's got something about the elect or chosen ones. So if we pull this together, they're interpreting that um, the sprout of Lebanon are the priests, the sons of Zadok. Now we know what happened was that um, to be priests, you have to be Levites, and you have to be of the family of Aaron. And then later on, you have to be of the family, uh, Aaron goes down, you, you've got to the time of David and Solomon, you've got Abiathar being a high priest and ruling. He's ousted by command of Solomon 
through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. From that point forward, only a descendant of Zadok, which was another side of the family, can be priests. So only Zadok priests. We see this still in um, the last 10 chapters of Ezekiel in the Millennial Temple. They will be priests, but they will be Zadok priests, not anyone. Okay, not just a Levitical guy or some non-Levitical person, but it has to be a Zadok priest. Much like uh, the descendant of uh, the Messiah had to be a descendant of Shem, and then he had to be a descendant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And then when Jacob broke the, the kingship and priesthood and stuff up, he made a prophecy that the Messiah would come through Judah. So he's got to be a descendant of Judah. Well, in time, there's tons of descendants of Judah. So at a certain point, another prophecy is given is that he would be a descendant of David. So it has to be a, the, the line of David through the line of Judah, not one of the others. So a lot of times in time, they, they narrow these things. So what happens is the Zadok priests are doing everything properly. The Sadducees rise up and the Pharisees, and then the seekers of smooth things, as it says in here, attack them, try to push them out. Because at a certain point, I'm ruling and I try to bribe you, I try to do stuff, and you're not going to have it. You're going to do your own thing. Well, you and I can argue publicly, but if that doesn't work, then I got to get rid of you somehow because I can't do anything. And that's exactly what happened. They ousted the priesthood, and one by one, the pre high priests were assassinated. And the Zadok priests moved to Qumran and to other places. Uh, one of the, I think it was Ananias III, actually went down to Egypt, which was probably the fulfillment of an Isaiah prophecy. Anyway, so a lot of these things were happening, but they were ousted. So in this case, uh, there is the sprout of Lebanon, which are this priests, the sons of Zadok, and the men of their council. So that's the Essenes. So they're talking about, in this point here, they're saying that this mentions the whole concept that the Sadducees gain power, and there's enough of a, a force to be reckoned with to hold them off, you know, like two or three, you know, we have, we've got mainly two parties in our government, Republicans and, and um, Democrats. In their case, they had Sadducees and Pharisees mainly because the Essenes kind of pulled out at this point because they understood the prophecies. But they basically had three, Sadducees, Pharisees, and Essenes. And then there were a lot of other smaller groups. Like we've got, I think, the Green Party and the Libertarians and smaller groups that never really do anything major. But these guys were fighting and killing each other to a certain point that they had a civil war. Many people on both sides died. That was between 80 and 90 BC. And they tried to make peace and continue, but they were so apostate. Everybody thought that they were supposed to be the government and they were supposed to kill people that didn't agree with them or wouldn't pay taxes or whatever. So they finally, about 165, asked Rome to step in to restore order. Well, Rome had recognized them as an actual uh, independent country and a friend, and a friendly country was asking for help, so they were under obligation to do so. So Rome stepped in in its normal pagan way and restored order, and nobody liked it. Each person thought that Rome would come in and put them in, in power. And so this is what the Sadducees had been doing. That was their, their MO for the longest time. We'll get a foreign nation to come in and force the people to keep us in power and to tithe and taxes and all this stuff. And so that's what's going on. So they ousted the Zadok priests. Now this is interesting to me that they would, I, I wouldn't necessarily see it this way, but they're saying, no, it's Romans and Zadok priests for our time period. The mountains quake before him, and the hills ha and the earth is lifted up before him, and the world and all that dwells therein. Who can stand from before his wrath? Who can rise against his furious anger? So no one can stand before the Lord when he actually moves. And the Lord's movement in their day was to make Messiah come, allow him to be killed for our sins, start the age of grace, and then the problems with the 
rebels in the Jewish government were destroyed by the Romans, and then Christianity spread into the Roman Empire uh, in time. So that was apparently what he had planned. This is what it says, and the interpretation is fragmented. It's about all the inhabitants of the world, something. Now, the next verse says, um, where is the young lion's den and the cave of the young lions? So this seems like we're talking about either Rome or a segment of Rome, like Pompeii coming in or uh, Pontius Pilate or something like that, if it's Rome and them in that time period. So the interpretation concerns a dwelling place for the ungodly of the nations. So this has probably got something to do with the Romans coming in, where the Romans stay, what they do, their idolatry, things like that. Now, this is interesting. Look at this. We get into chapter 2. It says, Whether the lion goes, there is the lion's cub, and none to disturb it. Now, this is, this is interesting because there's a lion that apparently represents a king or something. A lion's cub would be his child or someone following on the coattails of a king. And you can't, you could probably kill the cub easy, but you don't dare because the lion is standing there. Um, so none dares to disturb it. This interpretation concerns Demetrius, king of Greece. Now, he was king of Greece from 294 to 288 BC. Look at this carefully. He wanted to enter Jerusalem. Uh, let me stop there for just a second. Demetrius was one of these people. He was like Cyrus, uh, Camises, a couple of other guys, and then Demetrius. And Demetrius rises up and tries to become the next king. And he's ousted somehow. So he actually comes over and tries to um, attack one of the Grecian outposts in Syria. So this stuff is going on, or Egypt, or one of the other places. He's trying to come to the Middle East. So look, with that in mind, look at this. He wants to enter Jerusalem, or the Demetrius wanted to enter Jerusalem. Why? Because they don't have a whole lot of gold there compared to other places. On the council of the seekers of smooth things. Now, when we go through this, we've, we've seen this many times. The Seekers of Smooth Things is a kind of a pet name for the Sadducees. If you don't believe in life after death, you believe in just go with the flow, do what the government says, have a nice life. Don't rock the boat. They seek the smooth path. They don't want to fight. The Pharisees, on the other hand, said, no, there is a life after death and there's a hell. And I do not want to go there. So I am not going to do something that directly contradicts the law of Moses. I'm not going there. And if I have to die because of it, I have to die because of it. So they were true believers. The Sadducees didn't believe. So the Sadducees were called the seekers of smooth things. Now, with that in mind, Demetrius, king of Greece, wanted to enter Jerusalem on behalf or because of the council of the seekers of smooth things. So there's actually a proto-group of Sadducees in 280 to 290 BC that could not contain power, same kind of MO. They actually asked Demetrius of Greece, when he comes this way to attack somebody, to come into Jerusalem and fix their problem so that they can remain in power. You make, you Use your troops to keep us in power. We'll tax the people and tribute to you, and we'll remain in power that way. Can you imagine that? Just stop and think about that for a minute. Sadducees, who don't believe in life after death, they think once you're dead, you're dead. Therefore, if I can remain in power, even if it's massive suffering, um, so be it. And if I can... If I can't do this my way, there's enough people that want to kill me, then if I can have a foreign power step in at my behest and crush the rebellion, and all the foreigners want is money, I can tax the people and give them the money, remain in control, and I'll have life, you know, the rest of my life in, in riches. And it doesn't matter who I hurt or who I kill. It's a good deal to me, and that's what I'm going to do. 
So they sell out their country to pagans. Think about that. And so this has been, you can understand why they get that name, Seekers of Smooth Things. They don't believe in anything. They're going to betray anybody for any reason just to make a quick buck because they don't believe and they don't care. A believer would not do that. Oh, no, I would not do anything like that because I know what's coming. God, but even though this was the case, it wasn't time yet. God did not permit Jerusalem to be delivered into the hands of the kings of Greece from the time of Antiochus until the coming of the Roman rulers. But afterward, Jerusalem shall be trampled under their feet. So they understood this. Now, it is true that Israel got passed back and forth and had to pay tribute to the Syrians, to the Egyptians, to the Syrians, to the Egyptians, back and forth, back and forth. So, and, and they were all uh, being ruled by Greeks. It was the uh, Ptolemaic um, kingdom to, in Egypt and the Seleucid Empire in Syria, which were Greeks. And they were passed back and forth and back and forth. And there was the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, but they didn't move into Jerusalem and finish the problem. Jerusalem was never submitted completely and destroyed by any Greeks. That's what they're saying here. God did not permit him to do this. So apparently, the Sadducees would have gladly, since they don't believe anyway, if Demetrius would have come in and conquered Israel, even if they would have destroyed the temple, killed off 90% of the people, implanted them with Greek people, as long as they got to stay there and rule, they don't care. They'll bow down to a pagan deal, whatever. It doesn't matter. So it'll just be that way. So they just want power. So they wouldn't care. Imagine someone in government betraying the people like that. You trust them in government to make the right decisions, but they'll do anything to stay in power. It's just really freaky. But when the Romans came, then after that, the Lord did allow the Romans then to trample and destroy Jerusalem because it was after the time of Messiah. And that kind of people needs to be wiped out. And so that's what happened. Let's go on here and look and see. There's another piece I wanted to show you. I just thought it was amazing. Um, the lion... And apparently these are Romans, Rome, Roman centurions or somebody. But the lion tears enough for its cubs and chokes its prey for its lioness. So it provides food for its family. Interpretation is this concerns the furious young lion who strikes by means of his great men. I haven't identified who this is yet, but it might be Titus, something like that. Titus coming in to establish order one way or the other. And he winds up destroying the, the temple. But the furious lion strikes by means of his great men and by the means of the men of his council. So again, that's, I mean, that could be like a Roman council that told him to go destroy the temple or something like that. Or it could be his troops trying to restore order. The best way we can do it is the way the Sadducees tell us to do it. Right now, the temple is uh, taken over by weirdos. If you can go kill them all, put us in power, everything will be fine. Th those are the kind of people we're talking about. That's, that's mind-boggling that you could be living in Israel, see the temple, see the prophecies, and go that far with it. That is total apostasy, whoever these men are. Okay, and he fills his cave with prey and his den with uh, soil. I would think that would be spoil. I might have mistyped that. I'll have to go back and look. Interpretation, however, is this young lion of wrath who fills his cave with prey, he does it by, now look at this, he does this by executing revenge on the seekers of smooth things. So eventually, even the pagans get tired of this you know, stab me in the back every five minutes type stuff. 
So they will seek revenge on these people and hang men alive on a tree. Now that's something that the Romans did, crucifixion, which had never before been performed in Israel because it's a horrible thing to hang one alive on a tree. Very, very interesting. Um, and yeah, we'll stop here in, in two, but looking at this, behold, I am against thee, says the Lord of hosts, and I will burn her chariots and her with burn her chariots in the smoke. The sword will devour your young lions, and I will cut off the prey from the earth. The voice of thy messengers will be heard no more. That leadership was destroyed. The Sadducees, or the Pharisees rather, become Orthodox Jews, but the Sadducee group is no more. Now, in a sense, we have Karahite Jews that have some of their characteristics. They were kind of called Sadducees. Karahites today basically are saying that all of the things that the uh, rabbinic Jews do, the, the, the tassels, the tallit, the yarmulkes, the teflon, the, they would say that all, and the pr certain prayers before the, all that, they would say that's for the temple priests to do. That's not for normal Jews or anybody to do. So we don't do any of that stuff. We don't agree with oral Torah. We just follow the Old Testament as much as you can because there's no temple. Whereas the rabbinic Judaism, Orthodox Jews today would say, no, we follow the, the oral Torah. So that's a difference between them. But I doubt you'd find a Karahite Jew that is a atheist or a Karahite Jew that says, I don't believe in life after death. I, I know. So they're not exactly the same as Sadducees. So, but it's interesting. Uh, so let's look at this. So let's finish this out here. This interpretation for this verse, your chariots are the bands of soldiers. Okay, that makes sense. The young lions are his nobles and the members of his council. Remember, the members of his council might be Sadducees. It depends on which what we're talking about here. His spoils, and it is spoils. Say, I have a typo. That's why this is not prime time yet. Anyway, his spoils, look at this, are the wealth which the priests of Jerusalem accumulated, which they will deliver, you know, probably to Rome. Ephraim, Israel, will be given for a probably for a pray or a payment for this. Ephraim, Israel, of course, is always the rulership, so be Sadducees, Pharisees, Sadducees mainly. His messengers are his envoys whose voice, voice shall be heard no more. Um, just look at a couple of things here. This is interesting. Let's, I won't read this whole thing, but let me just read this one little piece here. For Nahum 3.1, because this goes along with what we're talking about. Interpretation concerns the rule of the seekers of smooth things. So the rule of the Sadducees from 288 BC down to this time when they're destroyed. Look at what it says. Now, think about this a minute. They don't believe God will do anything. They don't really believe in anything. They're almost like atheistic believers, if there could be such a thing. You know, believers officially, but they don't really care. They will allow... A pagan nation to come in and wipe you out if it makes them a buck and that's all they care about but the, their their mo is always to try to kill to try to control you and if they can't do it they'll make allegiance with some other power to come in and, and kill you so with that in mind look at this this concerns the rule of the seekers of smooth things the gen this is this is their punishment the Gentile sword, captivity, looting, burning, exile, and the fear of their enemies shall never leave their assembly. When you're that kind of a person, you're going to have to watch your back 24-7. The fear of your enemies will never leave. If your partner decides, if I have them bump you off, I'll get even more money, and he's just as bad as you, why wouldn't he do that? 
in a situation like that, one person attacks another. And the Lord allows that. We see that through a lot of things. So if you have a political party or a, a nation that's so anti its people, the people may raise up and do a rebellion, a revolution or something. But it gets to the part where it crumbles. Pharisee, Sadducee, Pharisee, Sadducee, and everybody trying to kill each other. And the Essenes just backed away from the whole thing, let them destroy each other. And their interpretation, and that's really powerful to me, a multitude of guilty corpses shall fall in their days. There shall be no end to the sum of their slain. They will also some stumble upon their own body of flesh, their unique sins or their, their weird theology is what destroyed them actually because of their guilty counsel. And it goes on and it talks about their association with the well-favored harlot. So that gets really interesting. But it just this the one verse here is just amazing. When you are someone who tries to destroy your own nation, even though you say you believe in God, and you would allow a foreign power to come in and kill your people, you're cursed. And the curse is the Gentile sword that you so like to use against other people. The Gentile sword, the captivity, the looting, the burning, the exile, and the fear of those people, when you turn your back on them, shall never leave your government or your assembly. Let them alone. God knows how to destroy them. I mean, try to counsel, I mean, try to convert them if you can, but wow, that is amazing. So stopping here for tonight, but just looking at this, if you think about it, they're saying that this is Nahum. And I always used to read Nahum and go, yeah, yes, Babylonians destroyed Assyrians. And yeah, we, we're done. And you know, you just kind of like, what else is there in there? This is in there. And if they're correct, the Sadducees and things in their time period, this kind of stuff happens. That's amazing. Now, even though this may not be have anything to do with us at all, or our time period, or the Antichrist, maybe, maybe not. But the same basic premise occurs. If there's always people in government, now we're actually talking about Israel at this point and the Antichrist, but if there's always people in government that betrays, and it's probably true everywhere, dictatorships and stuff like that, this is an amazing judgment of any kind of political, you know, uh, kingship or, or country or whatever that would do something like that to its people. So... It's interesting that the Dead Sea Scroll verse, or that one little piece of chapter one, came out last week. I just, it's really interesting. There are rumors of other things coming down the, the pipe uh, that aren't released yet, and rumors are rumors, so who knows. Uh, but I firmly believe in the next few years, if the Lord tarries and we're still here, there's no rapture, I think we're going to find even more things like this. So this is, and again, there's a lot more commentary just in Nahum that I think we need to look at that are going to be interesting. And we will get to it eventually, some of these other commentaries. Um, so right now we've got, and these are still a work in progress, as you can see, I, my one typo. Um, the Psalms 37, 127, 129, 118. Commentaries on Isaiah, Hosea, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, and Malachi. Those are pretty interesting. And then you get the non-biblical stuff like 11Q, Melchizedek. Uh, the ages of creation are amazing. Katina A, amazing. And going on down some of these others. So, Okay, let me go ahead and stop there for tonight. And let me just take a little bit of time and we'll go up and see if there's any questions. And thank you all for subscribing to us, and thank you for donating. Um, uh, Dolores gave a $5 donation. Thank you very much. Thank you for all you people who donate on PayPal and who buy our books. Give them out to your pastors and the people in your church. We really appreciate it. Uh, together, we can make a big difference in some of our churches. 
Diane says she received the ancient Seder Alam today. That's a really interesting book. Uh, the Seder Alam was written by a Jew about 160-ish AD, trying to explain the timelines, you know, like what is today, you know, and how we got there, using mainly the Bible, the Old Testament, and then whatever the rabbis said. And if there's any kind of historical note somewhere, kind of pulling all that together. But what he ends up saying is, the timeline was tampered with and he tells you who did it and why. And that's how we get to, um, let me see if I can find it here. When we go to our calendar. Um, so this year is 2021. According to the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, it's 5946. Let me back up one from here. Um, yeah, 5946. The normal Hebrew date modern Jewish date is 5781. So we're off like 160 some years. The Seder Alam explains how that happened. So we have actual written proof on the timelines and the anti-Messiah people doing things. So it's pretty interesting. Other than that, it's just a chronology book. But there's all sorts of cool things in there. Um, let's see here. Uh, Prescott donated ten dollars. Thank you very much. Again, we really appreciate everything you guys do. Lots of comments in there, so that's good. It's nice that we have a, a good community where we can kind of know each other and we get to talk to each other and stuff like that. Uh, thank you to Over, Overbuilt Automotive for donating $5. Thank you very much. Huh. Okay. Okay, you mentioned that some of the scrolls have a commentary. Any idea who wrote the commentary? Not really. Um, some of the people that look at them all the time have have begin to notice that the like the handwriting analysis. You can tell that probably the same guy wrote these two pieces, and somebody totally different wrote these because just the, the way the handwriting is. So you can kind of group scrolls together that are probably the same, at least person that copied them down anyway. Who actually wrote the scrolls, we don't know. In that case, though, like what we looked at tonight, the um, it's obviously a scene teaching, whether it's right or wrong. Their concepts are a scene-based, so it would have to be someone not um, like the, the ancient prophets themselves, you know, making a commentary, but someone in the Essene community. So that's probably in the 100 to 200 ish BC area, something like that. Um, heard a prophecy about uh, Netanyahu uh, that unless he gives up land, he will. Unless he gives up land, he will be the prime minister until the end. The new election is. Oh, okay. The new election is this week. 
I have not been uh, paying close attention to it because I've been working too much on these scroll, not too much doing this. And I'm getting toward the end though. We just mainly have, I need to go finish these things and then go through uh, cave 11. And we're going to keep doing this anyway, as I will go back through all this stuff all the time. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, like some of the comments about the um, the uh, hurricanes and things like that coinciding with what we do with Israel. Some just some comments and stuff about that. Pretty interesting. The comment, the, the part of the commentary that talked about the sprout of Lebanon, the Zadok priests, was this in the past or the future? Um, well, they're definitely interpreting it as happening in their time period. Um, there's no reason to assume that it's in our time period also, but the concepts are there. So the if we were to put it in today's language, we're, de we're definitely talking about corrupt denominations that are ousting um, Christians with conservative values. Um, so as a conservative Christian, for instance, I'm going to follow whatever the Bible says. If it says this is okay, then it's okay. If this is sin, then it's sin. And I'm just going to follow that. Uh, and other people are going to say, well, that's not politically correct anymore. Well, the anymore is the key. <laughs> Things don't change. If it's right, it's right. And if it's wrong, it's wrong. And so we need to follow scripture but we would have people actually inside of our church and you can think about that as a corrupted pope leading the catholics but then there's also corrupted uh, protestant denominations that would do the same thing so it all goes back to um following scripture and again the whole concept how this apostasy stuff starts you and i might debate on whether something does this really mean that or not you really feel one way, I really feel the other. Maybe we should separate. That's excommunication. You know, you go your way, I go mine. That's about as bad as it gets. You don't try to kill me, and I don't try to kill you. Um, if you're sinning, you're going to destroy yourself or hurt yourself anyway. And I don't want you to hurt the other people in my church. That's why we excommunicate you. Um, but you still might be a believer. You still might make it to heaven. And I'll try to help you if I can. But when they cross the line on that and say, you've become evil, you need to be destroyed, I will kill you myself, that all comes from that form of corrupt concept. And it's basically a seeker of smooth things, Sadducee concept. Keep power at all costs. No, if you're an actual believer, you know the person in power is God. And he doesn't like that kind of stuff. If he wants to replace me and put someone in my place, then it's probably a good idea that he do that. Um, so that's not what we want to do. We don't want to hold on to a position of power for any particular reason. But thank you for asking that. Yeah, somebody else was saying that the timing of these texts coming to light right about now is remarkable. Uh, and it is, yeah, the, lot, the kind of things that we're seeing. So, Mike says, hey, it looks like the beginning of a new book forming. Well, I'm trying to put all my notes in that kind of a thing now, so just in case I do. But yeah, I this kind of stuff would be good. And there's also, I would like to pull together all the details, as soon as I get the details for this one, 
together and look at all of the times of apostasy. Because you've got Abraham, a messianic figure at the end of that age, dealing with Nimrod, who is an antichrist figure with a one world government and a one world religion run by a guy named Anuki, who is a false prophet. And it's just amazing. You know, and then you get to the end of their age and you have Sadducees, Pharisees, Essenes, the doctrine changes, the corruption. And then Paul says the same kind of things will be at the end of our age. And he gives us several things like in the in the end times, people will be lovers of themselves, etc. And these things will fall. And he even mentions a couple of doctrines that get twisted specifically, uh, which don't seem to really make much difference. But then again, most of them don't anyway. It's They're twisted to the point that, again, you got to do it this way or I have to force you. So it's it's really interesting to see all those together, I think. If we can see some of the differences and some of the similarities and have a, a pattern to go by, I think we'll be able to spot Antichrist stuff a lot easier or what becomes Antichrist stuff. Uh, someone said they thought it had been calculated that this could be the 120th Jubilee. What do you think? Um, well, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, the right right now this is if this is 5946, the last Jubilee um, for our age starts in four years, and then from 25, I guess, yeah, 25 to 75 would be that last jubilee. But then, of course, you've got two jubilees, uh, excuse me, not jubilees, uh, two ages or unas in the millennial reign. So two sets of 500 years. Um, so we've got some other things to do. But we could figure that out somewhere, though. Um, let me go back here and see what I can... Okay, if that's the top of the wall. Is it? Okay, no. Give me just a second here. Okay, here we go. So if we were in the 12th una, so that's this one here, that's a period of 500 years. Um, let's see then. So that's, is that, I'm thinking we're, we're off, but if it's 12, 12 times, yeah, five would be 50 jubilees or 10 jubilees times. Okay, yeah. So this would be the end of the 12th. This would start the, the 120th Jubilee then, yeah. And then we get to the 140th at the end of the millennial reign. So you're right. So yeah, so if, if a Jubilee is 50 years, 10 Jubilees is 500 years. And so each one of these unas or periods in each of these ages are 500 years. So this is 10 Jubilees, uh, another 10, so that's 20. It would end at the 10th, 20th, 30th, 40th, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 10, and 20. So, yeah, we're, the we're, in, we're in the 119th Jubilee right now. The 120th will be starting in four years, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls. I had to stop and make sure I said that right. Now, we might be off on our calculations, but if we're calculating their calendar their way and we're doing it right that's where it would come in to be do people sponsor these archaeological digs uh, have their own motives and do you think they would purposely not publish certain fragments to suppress the truth um it's a definite possibility yeah uh we we've had things now now granted some things are so fragmented you got to try to figure out like with the calendar uh you could ignore it you can say it's a wacky cult who cares but how did they do their calendar so it actually took you know years and years decades to piece those those, those there was like over 400 if i remember correctly little bitty fragments that had to be pieced together to to figure out the calendar. So that's legitimate. There may or may not have been uh, ulterior motives, 
but it does take a lot of time to pull those fragments together. But now on the other stuff, like 11Q Melchizedek, that's pretty much straightforward. Why wasn't it published for 40 years? Because of what it says. So yes, that does happen uh, occasionally. But the nice thing about it is we have the secular archaeologists want to be the guy that found the whatever scroll because he'll get on other digs, he'll make more money. It's like anything else. If you find the buried treasure and you're a treasure hunter, you'll be hired and given more money to find more treasure. So in, in those digs, you're going to have like Jews and Roman Catholics and Protestants and atheists and secular people, and they just want to... Because if there's any question that somebody messed up a scroll, like put in a fake one, that'd ruin your career. So there's a lot of nice things going for us in that respect. But yeah, sometimes they see what's actually there and don't want it to come to light. What had happened was uh, the fragments that talked about the theology were deliberately held back. And then one of the archaeologists died and bequeathed all of his personal notes and photos to the Huntington Library in California. This was in the mid-1990s. So uh, 40s, to, you're talking about 50 years after the fact. And nothing wrong with these things. So the Huntington Library decided to take all that stuff and publish it in a book. Well, they got sued by somebody, said, you can't do that. He worked for us at the time. We own the pictures. We own this. And so it goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decides, well, technically that would normally be true, but the copyright should be to the people who wrote it. And it's his private pictures, uh, whether he was working for you or not, and he bequeathed all this stuff to somebody. They have the rights to it. And really, I mean, if I wanted to reproduce their book, I should be able to do so because... The copyright really belongs to the dead people from 2,000 years ago. And that was the whole concept. So they finally went ahead and published it. And that's when 11Q Melchizedek and several of these other things began to come out. And now we kind of know why. Pretty interesting. But we just need to uh, keep gathering the ones that we can. Yeah, Diane says we need to follow the law of the land unless it conflicts with the word of God. And that's the way it's always been. That can get you in trouble sometimes, but it's the way that it's always been. If you don't do anything, you, somebody will get in trouble, though. So we've got to um, stand up for what the Lord wants us to do in, together. Okay, let's see here. Let's go and see if there's any more questions or anything. Okay, I think I got to the end. So I think I answered all the questions, but this is just an interesting study. And again, it's nice to have these, and I don't have them finished yet, but out of what we did have, I think that's pretty amazing, uh, that concept that a Sadducee is someone who doesn't really believe but claims that they do, that will gladly hand over their nation to a foreign power as long as they continue to be rich or stay in power. And to that, God judges them with a fear and a destruction that never leaves their assembly. So that's pretty cool. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. So we'll be back Thursday night with a Q&A. And then next Monday, I think next Monday is the, if I remember correctly, the, I'm looking at the Gregorian calendar and I'm confused, but I think it's the, the Monday before Passover. Um, so what we'll try to do, I want to, I, I want to um, look at the Passover Seder and not the ritual, but I mean, look at the calendar, the date. And then look at the prophecy about the cutting off of Messiah, because there is a um, controversial part 
that we never really did figure out until the calendar came along. And I just wanted to kind of pull that together. One more proof that the calendar is probably real compared to the modern Jewish one. So we'll do that uh, next week. Okay, I'll go ahead and say good night then, and we will see you Thursday. God bless.